Hare Krishna. Jai. Is Holiness Sri Radhanath Swami Maharaj Ki? So on behalf of our presiding deity, Sri Sri Radhanath Swami, um, all of our deities and our devotees to our yatra, all right, we'd like to be a very hearty welcome to Dallas Yatra. Um, Maharaj has been touring the U.S. Uh, uh, for his uh, the, for the uh, book project, and uh, miraculous things have been happening everywhere, and uh, Dallas is not going to be an exception. Uh, we're already abuzz about the fact that uh, you know how there's going to be lots of weddings happening on 10 10 10, which is uh, Sunday the uh, 10th of October 2010. So they call it the 10 10 10 weddings. Uh, happens once in a lifetime, 10 10 10 weddings. So uh, on that day, we're going to have about 10 10 10 initiations at 10 to 10 in the morning, and 10 boys are going to be initiated. <laughs> That would be a once in my life and I will call them. Once again, Arch, a great welcome to you, uh, to Dallas. Uh, we've missed you for six years now. Uh, you have not visited, so uh, uh, we're going to get uh, more than six times the benefit <laughs> of you coming out and not being with us. This trip will take advantage of that. Uh, thank you very much for taking your time out and coming to Dallas and spending so much time, we've never spent this much time in Dallas, I think, uh, in the past we've never had you for, for this long a period, and we pray to Krishna that the next time you come, you come for a longer period. And every time you come, you come for a longer period, maybe one day to stay here, not go to Dallas. The Indians definitely look very happy today, seeing you. Uh, we've never had Darshan open this long. <laughs> after 7 o'clock, so that was really nice, that was a great treat for all of us. And again, thank you very much, we look forward to your association. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I am sincerely overwhelmed with gratitude to have this special fortune of being with all of you once again in Sri Sri Radha Kalachanji's beautiful temple. The darshan today so specially uplifting to the to the very soul Sri Sri Radha Kalachanji is attractive, divine qualities beckoning us back into their eternal pastimes in such a special way today. My special gratitude to Nityananda Prabhu, Manjulali Devi, Chaitanya Prabhu, and all of the devotees here for so kindly welcoming me. Of course, being in this beautiful temple, my heart naturally melts in a feeling of love in separation from His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. Every inch of this beautiful abode is so much an expression of His love for Srila Prabhupada and His compassion all of us. As I was walking with Nityananda Prabhu to the little room I'm staying, I passed by Srila Tamal Krishna Goswami's quarters. My mind was flooded with remembrances. 
there wasn't so many, but the quality of those remembrances are like sacred treasures within my heart. His kindness, I remember when I was just coming back after being astray for many years. There was a meeting here and nobody knew what to think of me. It's kind of still like that <laughs> sometimes. <clears throat> but Maharaj, Goswami Maharaj, had me in the room right next to him. And breakfast, lunch, and dinner, he had me taking prasad with him. Sometimes it was just the two of us. Other times he would invite different groups of people, but always included me. And we spoke for hours, every day, soul-searching discussions. And he would share with me his, his experiences and his realizations in serving Srila Prabhupada, both in Srila Prabhupada's presence and in the many years of separation. By his kindness, he loved to dance with me. <laughs> when kirtans we begin, he would sometimes come up and say, will you dance with me? <laughs> with such innocent, childlike affection. Recently, when I saw this gigantic book with photos of Srila Tamal Krishna Goswami, the first time I was looking through it, it's not the kind of book you can just skim through. <laughs> it's a formidable book. You have to practically <laughs> surrender your life to get through it. <laughs> But as I was looking through the pages, I was thinking, this is the history of Srila Prabhupada's movement. This really is a step-by-step, stage-by-stage history of ISKCON. Because at every stage of Srila Prabhupada's development from the earliest times, Srila Tamal Krishna Goswami was right by his side, assisting him. Srila Prabhupada knew, here is a person who is completely surrendered, who is completely dependent, dependable, and who I could count on to do anything especially the most difficult things that were really taxing Srila Prabhupada's mind in order to accomplish and that practically no one else could do. He would call on Srila Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. San Francisco, London, Germany, Los Angeles, book distribution, back to Godhead distribution, Harinam Sankirtan. I'm not saying it in chronological order. Developing India. Each of these primary activities that Srila Prabhupada established Srila Tamal Krishna Goswami was the person that he had to really establish and push it forward. 
Also, temples, development of temples, deity worship. It was right there, everywhere. And in the later years, more than anywhere else, this was very much his home here in Dallas. And to see his Samadhi Mandir is a very intimate experience, I think, in all of our hearts. Just now I'm on a book tour of this book, The Journey Home, that I had written. And actually, the first person to push, to really push me to write this book was His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. Here in Dallas, He heard some of the stories that I from time to time would tell people about those crazy days of hitchhiking to India from London and traveling around the Himalayas with sadhus. And we would remember it because it's, we first met in Bombay in 1971. The first day I met Prabhupada at the Cross Maidan Festival in 1971, on that same day, in the presence of Prabhupada, I was chastised by Tamal Krishna Goswami. <laughs> Very affectionately. But it was rememberable. <laughs> <clears throat> I understood that this person has the most difficult service to Prabhupada. <clears throat> what nobody else wants to do, he's willing to do it. Protect Prabhupada from people taking advantage of his physical presence. And then the next time I met Prabhupada, he preached to me. He preached to me very strongly in Bombay. I remember he saw that I, I had long matted hair and I was wearing the robes of a sadhu and I was carrying a water pot. That's all sadhus are allowed to carry according to what the way I was living. And he thought I was some kind of a hippie. <laughs> so he said, he said, this chanting of Hare Krishna will bring you higher than LSD. <laughs> and I remember thinking, then I don't want it, you know. I, <laughs> I gave that stuff up long ago. If, it, if it's anything like LSD, I don't want it. <laughs> but he was... He presented the philosophy so eloquently. But what I learned from that first encounter is how he wasn't just a kind of a stereotyped person just repeating. He re Srila Prabhupada says we have to repeat as it is without changing but with compassion, according to time, place, and circumstance, in a way that works. And Srila Prabhupada was expert like that. Whether he was in that program in San Francisco, with strobe lights pounding on him, and naked hippies all around him, or whether he was sitting under the elm tree at Tompkins Square Park, 
or whether he was speaking to cardinals or bishops or presidents of nations, or just simple mothers of devotees. He presented our teachings in such a way that was relevant and accessible to people. So I understood that, the first moment, how he presented. It wasn't, it didn't apply to me so much. <laughs> but from the way I looked, he immediately took a point that he thought I could really relate to. And he came, to, he took, brought the philosophy through that channel so that it would be interesting and it would touch my heart and it would be relevant to me. And that was his greatness. He really cared. He really wanted to. He loved Srila Prabhupada. He was so grateful for the gift that Prabhupada gave him, he wanted to share it with all the world. Then we were together again in Vrindavan. So sometimes we would speak of those days. And he said, you have to write a book. But this book should not be for devotees. He said, there's already so many books for devotees. Let there be more and more, but there's already so many. This story should be for the secular audience of the general population. Because this story will connect, they will connect to it. Other people asked me to do this, but when Tamal Krishna Goswami wants you to do something, <laughs> there's a special shakti that is quite irresistible. It's just his lifting of an eyebrow um, makes you take life very seriously. <laughs> So I felt I had to do something, but I wasn't really convinced of publishing it or really seeing it through. I was kind of doing it half-half. And Hridayananda Goswami was, he pushed me. And Satyaraj Prabhu pushed me and others. But Tamal Krishna Goswami's voice was echoing in my mind. So I counted Sladini Shakti Prabhu and Manmohini Devi, two very faithful, loving disciples of his, very capable. Actually, to go back a little, it was just about 30 hours before Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj was taken from this world by Sri Sri Radha Kalachandri to the eternal abode of Goloka Vrindavan. That I was sitting alone with him in his room in Sri Mayapur Dham. We spoke for about three, four hours that night. There was some event going on in the stage because it was the Gorpurnima festival. The GBC meetings were going on. He was having these wonderful kirtans in his room every night. The meetings were complete and there was this event happening and he came off the stage because he said he wanted to talk to me. He was the first speaker. We started walking. For about an hour and a half, we walked and talked. And a small group of Goswami Maharaj's disciples were following a distance behind. 
And then we went into the temple where the kirtat was going on for about 15 minutes, and he came and said, let's continue our talk. So we went outside and started walking again for about 45 minutes. Then he said, the mosquitoes are coming, so let's go in my room. So we went up to his room. And I don't remember, I think till about 11 o'clock at night we spoke. And during that time he also told me I should write this book. So after he passed away, I took it a little more seriously and I contacted Manmohini Devi and Ladini Shakti Prabhu because they're very literary people. And myself, anybody who knows me well knows that I haven't even, I don't answer more than two or three letters a year. <laughs> and I haven't written a single article for Back to Godhead. I just don't write. And to write for a secular audience? The, the only books I know is Chaitanya Charitamrita Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. Chaitanya Bhagavat. I don't know how to write a book for the secular people. So they were very patient. And I wrote something down. It was all one paragraph. because I didn't know how to make paragraphs. I just like And actually, I didn't know how to type. I've never typed. I think when I was in fourth grade, I got a typing class, but the, I long forgot that. So I had to kind of learn. Somebody gave me a little computer, and I had to learn how to type on it as I was. And I gave them this long paragraph. And they, they tried to teach me how to write, which was um, fun. <laughs> it was actually really fun. <laughs> Whether it ever happened, I had no expectation that it would really ever happen, that it would be a book. But I was just tr trying to do my duty to, to Mount Krishna Goswami and working with his disciples and having a fun time. I went to their house in Kansas. And, But then it was when Bhakti Tirta Swami Maharaj, there was a connection. I went to see him in May of, I think, what was it, 2005? I went to see him. He called me and said he had only three days left to live. So I went and I saw the miracle of how he was affecting people. I'm remembering how before Krishna took to Mal Krishna Goswami Maharaj, he created a renaissance in kirtan within our movement. In his rooms, he held these kirtans and really absorbed people from all over the world and just sitting together and doing nothing but chanting. And it's become the most popular institution of Mayapur during the meetings and during the festival since that time. Just sitting together and sharing our love for the holy name. Nothing else. Bhakti Tirta Maharaj, I saw I came, I was at a festival at Inspiration at New Vrindavan, and I had to leave early. I was supposed to give the last class in the afternoon on Sunday, and he called me and I told Anutama Prabhu, the organizer, I have to leave. He said, well, please give the morning class, then leave. I 
said, all right. So I gave the morning class and I told everyone, I'm leaving right now. Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj is calling me. And I left. And about 150 cars were following behind me. <laughs> <laughs> they all wanted to see Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj. And people were crowded in his room. And I saw people who were bitter for years, people who were heartbroken by different circumstances, people who didn't trust leaders, they were all different kinds of people. And everyone was weeping and crying, so deeply touched by his compassion. Continuous tears of affection, love and gratitude for him. And then when everyone left, I said to Maharaj, I said, I've never seen you do that before. He said, this is Krishna's blessings. He's given me this disease so I can affect people's heart in a deeper way than I ever have before. So I take this as a blessing. I'm only here to serve. If I can serve better in this situation, that is my, my life. I was going to leave the next day. I had pressing programs. And Maharaj, I went to, to say goodbye to him. But before I could say anything, he spoke. He said, I want to die in your arms. Stay with me. I said, Maharaj, I'm with you till the end. I thought it was going to be three days. He stayed eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and during that time, one day, he just looked in my eyes with tears. And he told me a story of Tamal Krishna Goswami. Uh, Goswami Maharaj appeared to him several times, very, very intimate dreams. <laughs> I'm not going to tell those dreams right now, but in essence, Tamal Krishna Goswami was telling him with tears that you have to come because Prabhupada is calling you. He said, Prabhupada called me and I had to come, and now Prabhupada is calling you. You have to come. And Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj asked in the dream, why are you crying? And Tamal Krishna Goswami said, because I know how my disciples, how much pain they endured when I left. My disciples, my well-wishers, and my friends, and now, all those who are connected to you are going to have to suffer the same separation. But you have to do it, because Prabhupada is calling you. And then Tamal Krishna Goswami told him, but I will come back to see you before you leave. One day, Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, it seems that it was a connection with Tamal Krishna Goswami. He said, what about this book? <laughs> and we talked about it. And he told me, you have, to write, you have to write this, finish it, and publish it. And I gave him so many reasons why I didn't want to. And he took my hand and said, promise me on my deathbed <laughs> that you will write, you will com write, complete, and publish this book. Srila <clears throat> Prabhupada would sometimes say, what to do? <laughs> I was in that kind of a situation. 
So I promised him. And I crossed, I called Man Mohini and Ladini Shakti Prabhus, and they came to Gita Nagari and tried to teach me how to write again. <laughs> and I'm forever indebted to both of them for all the help and encouragement and love that they showered upon me. And I really felt it was Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj right there, through them, giving me so much encouragement. And eight weeks passed about. It was about seven, I think, or s And I asked, and, and one day, Bhakti Tirta Swami Maharaj said to me, why isn't Krishna taking me? <laughs> I was supposed to leave so long ago, but I'm still here. I remember Narasimha's appearance day came, and he said, this is the auspicious day to leave. I'm way overdue. And, <laughs> and he was not supposed to be, he was very, very emaciated, one leg, tumors all over him. But he went to that temple room, and he started leading a kirtan, so forceful, and he wouldn't stop. And I was sitting right next to him, and I knew exactly what was going on. He really wanted to die in front of Radha Damodar and Radha Kala Chandri doing kirtan on Narasimha Dev's appearance day. <laughs> he was trying to chant himself to death. <laughs> This was my interpretation. He was just chanting and chanting and chanting and chanting, and he was putting so much energy, so much force. And then he ended the kirtan. It was a long kirtan for a man in that state. And before he spoke, he, t he turned to me and whispered in my ear. He said, I really wanted to, I really wanted to die while chanting today in front of the deities, but but Krishna's not letting me go. <laughs> and then he gave a lecture. And many days went by. And one day it was, you know the story, where he wrote that Vyas Puja offering to Srila Prabhupada, saying like Vasudev Datta wanted to accept all the sins of everyone in the universe so that they could be liberated and let, he said, let all their sins fall on my head and let me suffer perpetually and give them all liberation. Bhakti Tirta Maharaj saw a lot of suffering among devotees and he actually prayed like Vasudev taught, let their sufferings, come, let their sufferings and sins come upon me so that they could be free and happy. But he really meant it. So one day I told him that today is, I think it was the disappearance day of Mukunda Dutt, who was the kirtan singer, younger brother of Vasudev Dutt. And he said, Vasudev Dutt, this will be a great day to leave. <laughs> so he called all the devotees and they were, he was doing this Nirjal, not Nirjal, Nirjan Bhajan, where he wasn't meeting anybody for weeks. He was just meeting, you know, his, his personal caretakers and myself. He wouldn't meet anyone else. He was like in seclusion, just totally absorbed in his own bhajan. But on that day, he called all the devotees to do kirtan in his room. And he said, I'm going to go today. I think, I think so. And they were singing and singing for a couple hours. Then he stopped the kirtan and said, I thought I was going to go with, during the kirtan, but it, I'm not going to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you could all go. <laughs> One day he said, why do you think it is that I'm not leaving? He said, I know. He said, Tamal Krishna Goswami told me that he was going to come back before I leave, and he hasn't come back yet. And then one day, devotees from Dallas 
somehow they got some inner inspiration from Tamal Krishna Goswami to bring his original little Radha Damodar deities. Yes, they brought them to Gita Nagari and set them up right in Bhakti Tirta Maharaj's little house. And Bhakti Tirta Maharaj went to have the darshan. And from Dallas these deities came and there was a picture, a photograph of Tamal Krishna Goswami with those deities. And he said, yes. He, he said, he has come. He promised me he would come. And I see that he has come through his disciples, in his picture, and in his original personal deities. He said, now I know I can go. And soon after that, he left us to join Tamal Krishna Goswami, Srila Prabhupada, and Radha and Krishna's eternal pastimes in the spiritual world. So coming here is a very special experience for me in this regard of the book tour that I'm on. Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj really personified one who's seeking the essence of service. Should I end here or continue? You sure? <laughs> Should I continue speaking or do kirtan? What is it? Speaking. I am. You're obedient. Beautiful. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu revealed the spirit of capturing the essence of pleasing the Lord through our service, through the example of his devotees. May I share a few stories? The devotees from Bengal would come every year on Lord Chaitanya's invitation to Jagannath Puri, where they would stay for four months with the Lord and celebrate so many festivals. In fact, being with each other and the Lord, everything's a festival. In Krishna consciousness, it's really like that. If we have the spirit of unity, and we're really connected with each other's hearts and chanting the holy names and hearing about Krishna and sharing devotion to, together, every day is a festival. The devotees were... Shivananda Sain was organizing the tour for two to four hundred devotees every year. Adwaita Charya was their leader, Nityananda Prabhu would come. And one year, Damianti, the sister of Raghava Pandit, she was preparing hundreds of preparation 
and putting them in cloth bags and sealing them. And some condiments she would put in earthen pots. And there was one devotee that was assigned to carry them all from Panihati to Puri. That's about at least three-week walk with the other devotees. It's probably close to a thousand miles or kilometers. And the way Damianti cooked, it wasn't ritualistic. It was with so much personal desire to please the Lord. She would make certain preparations that were quite rich. And she was thinking, Lord Chaitanya is going to eat those, and the next day he's going to have indigestion. So then she'd make special preparations to cure his indigestion. She would take ginger and all these other things and mix them with mud from the Ganges and make them into balls and really nice digestive things. She would make shukata, which would cure the acidity in his stomach. And whenever Lord Chaitanya ate, he is bhavagrahi, means he accepts the mood of devotion of his devotee. And Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami sp specifically uses these words that being the supreme personality of Godhead, he accepts the purpose in which everything is offered. So when he was eating these bitter foods, these neem leaves and bitter melons and ginger preparations, he was tasting the sweetness of her motherly love. And he was absolutely satisfied. Things that were so bitter, that were medicine, that anybody else would go, oof. For him, it was nectar. Because he was tasting the love of his devotee. This particular year, they all arrived on the day that the Vijay Vigraha, or the festival deity of Lord Jagannath, is taken to the lake called Narendra, where there is a boat festival. The Vijay Murti's name is Govinda. There was, the deity was on a boat, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people doing kirtan and dancing and chanting as he was on his boat ride, and everyone was so happy just seeing Govinda taking a boat ride. They were more satisfied than going on an ocean liner to a paradise island themselves to see Govinda on a boat. Because this is bhakti, where we actually look for joy and find joy in serving others in making others happy, and especially in doing so, making Krishna happy. Trying to find happiness for ourselves is very fleeting and actually very shallow. But to the extent our happiness is the happiness of God, is the happiness of other living beings, that happiness actually elates the soul with something that is so real and so deep because it's spiritual. Paradukaduki. Srila Prabhupada quotes the scriptures, this is the quality of a saintly person. Another person's suffering is my suffering and another person's happiness is my happiness. Because that attitude, more than anything else, gives pleasure to the Lord, who is a humbija pratapita, who is the father and the mother of all living beings. 
Now, if I want to make Ladini Shakti and Manmohini happy, I'll try to make Tamal happy. Yes, a little Tamal Lata, is it? Tamal Kaviraj, yes, that's right. It's natural. If he's in pain, the parents are in pain. If he's happy, then they're happy. So Paradukha Dukhi. The Lord is, finds the greatest satisfaction when we make sacrifices for the welfare of others. And that sacrifice is the source of the greatest internal ananda or ecstasy because it nourishes our soul. It's the nature of our soul. Selfishness is Maya's way of just cheating us. Maya means that which is not. What we're struggling so hard to achieve, to become happy, and what sometimes we accrue so much negative karma to achieve to become happy, is not what's going to give us happiness. Selfishness starves the soul. It aggravates our material entanglement. Selfless service. Service that pleases Krishna, God. Service that is an act of compassion that uplifts others. That gives actual, real, substantial experience of happiness to the soul. And therefore, the greatest saints oftentimes exhibit extreme examples of this. And we cannot imitate them, but the principle should be embraced. Like little Prahlad, he was a five-year-old boy, and his father was trying to murder him, kill him in so many ways. His father hated him. And Prahlad was always offering his obeisances to his father, and always trying to help him. Didn't matter what his father did to him. He was always the well-wisher, trying to help him. <laughs> and even when his father was killed, when the Lord, Narasimha, offered Prahlad any benediction, he said, I don't want anything for myself. If I ask anything for myself, I'm not your devotee. I'm just a business person. I'm giving and I'm taking. I only want to give. I don't want to take anything. But if you insist, give my father liberation. I loved him. I always will love him. Give him liberation. And Thakur Haridas, he was beaten 22 marketplaces just for being a humble and kind devotee. And he prayed from his heart of hearts, my Lord, whatever offenses these men are doing by beating me and trying to kill me and torturing me, let all my pious acts and all my devotional acts be exhausted, but give them love of God. Forgive them. Don't let what they're doing to me hurt them in any way. And Lord Chaitanya could not punish those people because Haridas was praying so strong for them. And Vasudev Dutt, we gave his example. And in other religions, there's Jesus. They're extreme examples, but they're teaching us that it's this seva, or selfless service, that's the real essence. So all the devotees were finding the highest joy seeing Govinda riding on a boat. A simple thing. But Lord Chaitanya, who's in the mood of Radharani, was in absolute ecstasy, and he was inducing everyone to be in absolute ecstasy. Then all the devotees of Bengal arrived. 
Sri Chaitanya was so happy to see them, right in the midst of this festival. He, he embraced. Every devotee was bowing down to him, and he'd lift them up, embrace them, put garlands on them, anoint their limbs with sandalwood pulp. Then they all danced and chanted together. At the end of the festival, Lord Chaitanya brought them all to his place and served them sumptuous Jagannath Prasad and took Prasad with all of them. It's wonderful. Then he said, Next today, tomorrow morning, early, when Jagannath gets up, we will be there to do kirtan. Should I continue? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> the next morning, very early, they were up when Jagannath was arising, and they had darshan. They offered their hearts and souls to the deities. Srila Bhakti said, Hanta Saraswati Thakur used to say, do not try to see Krishna. Try to serve Krishna in such a way that he's happy to see you. That was their mood. Then early morning, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu divided his devotees into seven groups and established seven kirtans, simultaneous. He appointed a kirtan singer for each group and a lead dancer. There were four drums in each group and many kartals and singers and dancers. And he induced them all to sing and he was going from group to group to inspect them. And each group was thinking, the Lord is only with us. He just stays with us, just like Krishna did with gopis. And after some time, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu danced. Such a dance. As he was dancing, he was in so much of the ecstasy of love love of Krishna. He was in the mood of Radha. <coughs> Radha bhava duti subalitam nomi Krishna swarupam. Lord Chaitanya is Krishna who came to taste the sweetness of Radha's love. He's Krishna with the heart of Radha and the complexion of Sri Radha. As he was dancing with his devotees, chanting the holy names, his hairs were standing on end. Sometimes his eyes, there were torrents of tears pouring from them. Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami says that his body, the hairs were standing on end like the thorns of a shamuli tree. How many of you have ever seen a shamuli tree? Anyone else? I'm going to tell you a story about this. <laughs> <clears throat> this happened just before I left India. This year. It was long back in April. And we, were ha we, we have a farm community about three hours north of Bombay. And we have 25 acres that we're trying to develop as self-sufficient. 25 acres are agriculture, rice, vegetables, fruit trees, flowers growing there, some grains. And the other 25 we're developing as a retreat center for people to come. So we've built a first cottage out of eco-friendly materials. All the bricks are made out of the mud from our own land made by hand. It's very nice. So we invited Janani Vas Prabhu and Pankajangari Prabhu to be there for this inauguration because they're very close with our temple. <clears throat> Everyone knows them? They are the head pujaris for Mayapur Dham. In one sense, they're the head pujaris for our whole movement. That's our international center. So we had kirtan, and we had classes, and we had nice prasad, and the next morning everybody kind of left, and we just were walking around the property. And we were walking to one area, kind of a jungly area, 
where there was nothing developed. And suddenly Janani Vas said, that's it? That's, that's it? And I said, that's what? He said, that's a Shamuli tree? And I can't tell you, I've been reading about Shamuli trees for 40 years. <laughs> and I've never seen one. Because there's so many examples in Chaitanya Bhagava, Chaitanya Charitamrita, where his Lord Chaitanya's hairs would stand up like the thorns on a Shamuli tree. And I said, where, where? And he showed me right there, that's a Shamuli tree. Incredible. From the roots, all the way up the trunk and all the branches, there's thorns coming out. Completely. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And they're, they're not like the thorns that prick you. They're kind of wide kind of thorns. I guess they do more than prick you. They stab you. <laughs> <laughs> but the tree really looked like he was in ecstasy. Or, or she, she, I really don't know. But it was just like... All around the trunk, all around every branch, we're just coming out like this. I think, that's it. Lord Chaitanya's body was like this. And I was so excited to finally see a Shabuni tree. I've been talking about it in my classes for years. I went to embrace it, and Jananiva said, No, don't do that. <laughs> Shrinanivas, Prabhu. So that was very special. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was dancing and sometimes his complexion would change and sometimes all these transformations that the world has never seen. He danced and danced and danced hour after hour after hour and his enthusiasm was increasing at every moment until it was the afternoon. So that means they were already going for about eight hours. They started early morning, about four, and now it's the afternoon. And somehow or other, Nityananda Prabhu, because there was all these drums from all seven kirtan groups, they were all together playing and playing in cymbals, and everybody's voices were loudly chanting, and all the residents of Puri, they all were they all joined the kirtan. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu kept repeating the verse that Swarup Damodar Goswami was singing, let my head fall at the feet of Lord Jagannath in the kirtan hall called Jagan Mohan. That one verse incited such ecstatic love from his heart. So Nityananda Prabhu somehow or other got the murdungas to go soft and all the singers to go soft. And when everything became very soft, Lord Chaitanya came into his external state of consciousness. And Lord Nityananda said, the devotees are completely exhausted and hungry. Please stop this kirtan. <laughs> so Lord Chaitanya, out of sympathy, he stopped the kirtan. And then he went with all the devotees together. They all bathed in the sea. Then they took nice prasad together. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went back to his room. And he, after taking prasad, and it was the rule, according to Prabhupada's translation, that every day after the noonday prasad, Lord Chaitanya would lay down and Govinda would massage his body very lightly. And then Lord Chaitanya would go to sleep and Govinda would then take Lord Chaitanya's remnants of prasad. On this particular day, Lord Chaitanya laid right across the entrance to the Gambira, his room. And Govinda said, please, Lord, kindly move slightly so I can get in to massage you. So he was blocking the doorway. And Lord Chaitanya 
was laying there with his eyes closed and he said, I am too tired, I cannot move. <laughs> and a few seconds later, Govinda said, please slightly move so that I can get around you to massage you. I am too tired, I cannot move. He asked again and again. Finally, the Lord said, do it or don't do it, whatever is in your mind. So Govinda understood. He was supposed to massage the Lord. So he took a piece of Lord Chaitanya's own outer cloth and placed it over Lord Chaitanya's body. Then he walked over it. And when he got inside, he can come and massage Lord Chaitanya's feet and his legs and his back. He massaged. Lord Chaitanya went to sleep. Forty-five minutes later, Lord Chaitanya suddenly woke up. And he found Govinda was still massaging him. He said, why are you still massaging me? Have you taken your lunch? Govinda said, no. The Lord said, well, you're supposed to take your lunch at this time. Why are you still here? Govinda said, because, I, because you're blocking the doorway and I couldn't cross over you. The Lord said, why didn't you cross over the same way you crossed over to come in to go and take your lunch, Prasad? Govinda was completely silent. But in his mind he was thinking, it is an offense to walk over you, my Lord. I'm willing to commit hundreds and hundreds and thousands of offenses and suffer all the reactions in order to serve you and please you. But I am petrified with fear to even commit the slightest trace of an offense for myself. Lord Chaitanya is in the heart. He knew Govinda's mind. Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami, he writes, that Lord Chaitanya orchestrated this pastime just to show the finer etiquette of selfless love. And Govinda was again and again an example of this. I'll give another example of Govinda. This time, Tamal Krishna Goswami must have shared with all of you some of the incredible variegatedness of being with Srila Prabhupada personally. Well, the principle is the same here. One day, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he, he was in the mood of Srimati Radharani after Krishna left Brindaban for Mathura. And Uddhava came back to give a message. He was intensely in separation. Love and separation. And one day, as he was laying in his room, resting, he had a dream that Krishna was on the bank of the Yamuna in the forest of Vrindavan. And there was a circle of gopis dancing around him. And in the center next to him was Srimati Radharani. He was watching the Rasa Leela. Suddenly Govinda woke him up and said, it's time to go to the temple. So Lord Chaitanya came out of his rest. And he felt very sad that he wasn't in the Rasa Leela anymore. And he would always stand way behind the Kirtan Hall of Jagan Mohan near the Garuda Stamba, out of his humility, and have his and 
look at Lord Jagannath from there. On this day, he was gazing upon the beautiful form of Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra. And according to Kaviraj Goswami, there were hundreds and thousands of people crowded in the temple room that day. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was looking. He was saying Krishna. Suddenly, this old, simple-hearted, poor Orian woman, Orian means from Orissa, just a local lady, she was so enthusiastic to see Lord Jagannath, but there were hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people packed in the temple, and she was small. She couldn't see over anyone. So what she did is she put her, she started climbing the Garuda Stamba. And as she was climbing up, she put her feet on Lord Chaitanya's shoulder. She shirada kalachanji ki. Should I continue? Okay. She put her feet on Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's shoulder and she was standing with one foot on Lord Chaitanya and one foot on Garuda, <laughs> gazing at Lord Jagannath. When Govinda, the personal assistant of Lord Chaitanya, saw this, he said, he quickly, very kindly and graciously, but he took he said to the lady, you have to get down, you can't be like this. So she came, she was coming down. Now, do you think Lord Chaitanya was angry with the lady for standing on him with her feet? He was angry with Govinda. He shouted out, oh Adivasya, which means, oh uncivilized one. <laughs> do not impede her enthusiasm to see Lord Jagannath. Why have you done this? Let her see Lord Jagannath to her full satisfaction. Meanwhile, the lady, upon hearing his words, she came to normal consciousness, and she realized what a mistake she made. She was standing on the Supreme Lord and his most intimate devotee, and she started begging forgiveness and bowing down. And Lord Chaitanya, he prayed to Lord Jagannath. He said, Lord Jagannath has not given such eagerness to me as he has to this lady. Just look at her. She has absorbed her body, her mind, her very life in the loving service of the Lord. She doesn't even know she's not an external consciousness. Just see her eagerness. Then with folded palms, he looked at Lord Jagannath and prayed, oh Lord Jagannath, please give me this eagerness. Then he looked at the lady and with folded palms and a humble heart, he begged this old lady, please bless me that I will also have such eagerness and absorption in Jagannath as you have. It is my prayer. Now in this regard, Srila Prabhupada explains that there are many rules and regulations. <laughs> but the heart of them all is that eagerness and enthusiasm to please the Lord. What's really important is are we pleasing the Lord? What is our consciousness? Krishna accepts our purpose. There's a beautiful story in Srimad Bhagavatam of Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj was asked by Vamanadev for three steps of land. His guru, kind of guru, Shukracharya, told him, don't give this dwarf anything, because he's Vishnu, and he's going to take everything away from you. 
And you know, gurus like to have disciples who are the king of the universe. <laughs> you don't want to lose that. What? So, <laughs> Bali Maharaj said, I'm going to give him what he wants. I promised him. And Shukracharya was so angry, he cursed him. He said, I curse you, you will lose everything and you will become, you will, put in, you will be put in prison, you will be arrested and everything will be gone. And he walked away. And Bali said, take your three steps. And with the first step he covered, with the first two steps he covered everything that Bali Maharaj owned. And then he imprisoned him. Why? Because you promised me three and you only have enough for two. And Bali Maharaj was in a very embarrassing situation. Not only did he lose everything he had, but he was completely humiliated before his family, his, his armies, his kingdom, everyone, because now he's a penniless prisoner. And Prahlad congratulated him for his good fortune. And his wife congratulated him for his good fortune. And Bali said, Vamana said, where should I put my third step? He said, the only thing I have left is my life. I offer you my life. Place your third step on my head. And he did. And then Vamana Dev gave him a spiritual planet. <laughs> and said that I'll be there with you always as your gatekeeper. Gave him everything. Then after all that, Vamanadev turned to Shukracharya and said, you are a very, very erudite, professionally ritualistic expert person at doing sacrifices. Please, whatever mistakes that Bali have done, in the execution of his sacrifices, in the execution of his rituals, in the execution of his service, please tell us those and neutralize them. And Bali Maharaj's words are some of the greatest things, greatest verses ever spoken in this world. Shukracharya's words. Shukracharya said that the purpose of every sacrifice, the purpose of life, is only to please you. And Bali Maharaj has given you great pleasure. Therefore, there is no mistake that he has made. Whatever mistakes are there are irrelevant if one pleases the Lord. And you are pleased. He said, in one execution of one's of, of a sacrifice or one's duties to the Lord, even if mantras are mispronounced, even if one is not able to properly follow the four regulative principles of that particular sacrifice, even if one makes mistakes regarding the time, the place, or the people, or the particular actions or rituals. Everything becomes perfect if one chants your holy names. Srila Prabhupada quotes Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the purport. Harinama, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nasteva, 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 Gatiranyata. That any type of spiritual religious activity is full of faults, no matter how hard we try in this age of Kali. And Prabhupada quotes Jiva Goswami when we're doing deity worship, when we're performing yagyas or whatever service we may be performing, we should really try our best to do everything as appropriate as possible. But even if there is a flaw, 
if we are sincerely chanting the holy name with the intent of pleasing the Lord, then all of those offenses are nullified. Because the Lord is bhavagrahi. The Lord is kali kale nama rupe krishna avatar has descended within the sound of the name. And when we have this desire, a, a service attitude, trinadapi sunichena taror iva sehishnana amani na manadena kirtaniya sadahari. Lord Chaitanya said, take this verse and put it on the string of the name of God and keep it on your heart always. To be humble like grass, tolerant like a tree, eager to offer all respect to others and not to demand respect for oneself. In this way, we could please Krishna when we're chanting his holy name. And then there's whatever mistakes that we may commit. They're not even mistakes anymore. If Krishna accepts it. Atapum beard vijastreshtas varana shrama vibhagasha shvanushtatasya dharmasya samsadir hari toshana. Whatever our occupation, whatever our status in society. If we please Krishna, that is our success. And what pleases Krishna? Bhakti atvananiya shakya aham evam vidorjana. Bhakti, devotion, love is the only thing that pleases Krishna. And at whatever stage of realization we're on, our love is expressed by our sincerity by the sincerity of our intent and purpose to be a humble servant and please the Lord and please his devotees and be compassionate to all living beings. So fighting over different ritualistic rules and regulations, no sense. The main thing is the intent to really please the Lord. These things can all be adjusted, modified, but the real thing is, are we really pleasing the Lord? What is our intent? Shukracharya became perfect by appreciating Bali Maharaj. The disciple delivered his guru. Yes? Bali Maharaj was the disciple of Shukracharya, but he disobeyed his guru but because he did it with, with the humble spirit just to please the Lord, and because Shukracharya later appreciated that, Shukracharya was delivered. And he spoke this beautiful verse. Saragrahi, a true devotee, Prabhupada says, is one who is always seeking the essence. And what is the essence? What pleases Krishna? What pleases Guru? Bhakti Vinod Thakur sings, Grihe Thako Vane Thako Sadahadi Bole Thako Sukhe Dukhe Pulo Nako Badane Hari Nam Korore Gai Goda Madhu Sware Gai Goda Madhu Sware this is Lord Chaitanya's message to the world. Whether you are a grihasta, with a husband, wife, children, a job, paying mortgage, <laughs> just trying to survive in the world through all that, or whether you're a swami living in the jungle, in a cave, doesn't make any difference. If we have a sincere intent to please the Lord by humility, forgiveness, and respect for others, and in this spirit we're chanting the holy names, 
then we will be liberated beyond the temporary flickering happiness and distress of this world. And we will, Paramdrisvani Vartate, we will be given a higher taste. When the Lord is pleased by our intent, by his mercy, he gives us this higher taste, this anandam buddhivardhanam, this ecstasy that we're all seeking, that is within our own hearts. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sajja Kabunoi Sravanadi Sudhichiti Kodiya Yudhoi. That love for Krishna is dormant within the heart of every living being. By chanting in this spirit and associating with saintly people, this love is awakened. <coughs> and what pleases Krishna more than anything? When we love him, when we want to love him, when we want to please him. And all the rules and all the regulations of all the scriptures and all the universes are all meant to bring us to the platform of always remembering Krishna with love and never forgetting Krishna. This is the essence. This is what Srila Prabhupada gave his life, his soul, to give us. He wanted us to be very strict as far as possible. But at the same time, he told us that I'm 90% lenient. <laughs> he wanted to see that we're honestly and sincerely trying. And he knew if that's there, we become perfect. And if it's not there, even if we do 100% perfectly, we're lost. Krishna is in our heart. He sees, the, he sees our intent. And we chant the holy name to purify that intent. And we serve to express that intent. Tamal Krishna Goswami, he saw that quality in Srila Prabhupada and he gave his life, his soul, his everything to serve and assist Srila Prabhupada in that great mission of giving this essence of unmotivated, unconditional love of God to everyone and anyone who will accept it. And we're all so fortunate that we, we have a chance to be a part of it all. These are just some of the thoughts I'm having sitting here with all of you in Sri Sri Radha Kalachanji's temple. Thank you very much. Thank you.